we were we were thinking of getting a a brand ambassador a face for the brand right and um we we did not come up with a better name than shilpa with the with her way of living with the values that she um you know was was standing for was was very close to us as mama earth we reached out we we met her in delhi um you know which was our first meeting where we sort of went pitched her what mama earth was all about and we had taken this small bag of products just to show her um you know how we looked um and i remember you know we had like a decent uh, 45 minute conversation um where she raised a few concerns questions around the brand around the ingredients and she was well informed she she actually knew some of the ingredients that that should have been avoided and um you know after that 45 minute session we just left the bag there we we you know requested her to try out and we came back and for the next 3 months i i think we were very eagerly waiting for her revert which did not come we followed up nothing happened right and we were like see this is not happening we haven't heard back and we lost all hopes and i think it was after 9 months when we got a call where you know she sent us this message that she had been using the product for all that while to see how they did you know, on her son vian and um you know she loved the products and that's how she wants to come on board and I mean I mean the the surprise was that she didn't just want to be the face of the brand but she also wanted to invest in the company which was which was our first you know um <laughs> I think the solid uh, uh you know interaction with her where we said that okay whatever we are doing we are headed in the right direction and there are people who are believing in us This is Siddharth Alwalia welcome to the 100x entrepreneur podcast This episode is brought to you by Prime Venture Partners an early stage VC fund led by Amit Somani, Shripati Acharya and Sanjay Swami. Prime is often the first institutional investor in category creating tech startups in fintech, SaaS, healthcare and education such as Mygate, Neo and Reco. To know more about Prime visit primevp.in. Today we have with us the husband wife duo co-founders of Mama Earth, Ghazal and Varun Alag. Welcome to 100x Entrepreneur Podcast, Ghazal and Varun. Hey, thank, thank you. You guys have been, you know, great friends. Uh, we've both known each other uh, for the last five, six years. It's tremendous to yeah. see, you know, your journey. It's, I'm, I'm so glad and, uh, you know, it just fills my heart to see, you know, how far Mama has come. Hey, thank you. Thanks, thanks. And I, I, I still remember... the you know, uh, us meeting on those jaita prees where your office was in south yeah. delhi when you were in baby gogo and we were we hadn't even launched at that time we were just trying to understand how to get uh, the community piece right and we were learning from you but uh, yeah i mean uh, some some great good old days and and it's fantastic to see you know uh, the the current scale of mama earth uh, you guys recently shared uh, i think on the your story article that the current net revenues yearly are have crossed 500 crr you you have some fantastic investors you know sikoa india fireside stellaris titan capital and uh, mama is also asia's first made safe certified product and and for our listeners uh, to share about how you got started on your journey you you founded mama right in 2015 uh, that's the time frame 16 2016 yeah 2016 and uh, Gazal probably shed more light on the journey itself. And and how you how you got started was uh, your son Agastya was allergic to some ingredients in Indian baby care products, and you did market research for eight to ten months on creating toxin free uh, products. So I'll, I'll let uh, the mic you know pass over to you to to start how how the you conceptualized this idea uh, way back in 2015 and 16. I think I think Siddharth it started with a with a you know like you said a personal journey of not being able to find the right kind of products uh, for our son and you know we were relying on uh, importing a few products from outside of India and that was a pain and when we talked to a lot of people around us we figured that this was not just us who were facing this problem there were a lot of other parents around us who were actually doing the same and were not too happy um which is where you know we we 
realized that there was a gap in the Indian market um, which could be um, solved. And rather than I think waiting for anyone else, we thought let's let's pick up our research glasses, let's figure if we can do it or if it's even possible to do the same in India or not. And we sort of did that. We realized it was possible. If that's how we launched Mama Earth in December of 2016 with six baby care products at that time. And, and what about like you, we actually worked very intensely with MadeSafe.org, which is a not-for-profit organization based out of US that certifies products to be completely free of harmful toxins. Um, and our formulation journey and R and D journey um, was was helped tremendously by the guidance that they provided us. And uh, what, what was your background prior to Mama Earth? And what was Gazal's background prior to Mama Earth? So uh, I, I'd, I'd spent about ten years in in the CPG industry. So uh, started my journey with Unilever um, in in sales uh, and a bit of marketing in the deodorants category. Uh, moved on to managing and marketing Smyrna for India. Uh, and then for the last four years of my corporate career, I was with Coca-Cola. I was uh, heading brand Coca-Cola for India, Nepal, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, and, and managing marketing, brand launches, etc. cetera, um, for them. And, uh, Gazal, why don't you share yours? Because I'm, I'm otherwise a computer graduate. I was working with emphasis in collaboration with NIIT back then. I, I used to be a corporate trainer, post which I went to New York Academy of Arts to uh, you know, further take up my passion for painting. And I was honestly very happy. I was painting, I was exhibiting nationally, internationally. I was selling my work. I was chosen as the best, um, you know, amongst the top 10 best artists of India as well. And that was that was my you know comfort zone. I thought I'd figured out what I need to do for the rest of my life, <laughs> which is when we got pregnant and uh, Agastya came to our lives, and very closely Mama Earth followed up, and that's how I'm here. And uh, how did you decide? You know what roles will you play as co-founders? Like Varun chose to focus on distribution, and uh, what part? Uh, you led the product and the community part, Gazal? Yeah, yes. I think we, we, we played to our strengths, yeah. And, um, I mean, uh, when you're just two of you, you have to divide work. You just say, okay, ye mujhe aata hai, kar lunga. <laughs> ye tujhe aata hai, you do it. Right? <laughs> I mean, and, and of course, then once you start doing all of that and then you start scaling, you get, you know, start hiring people. And, and those functions itself start sort of, you know, shaping up even sharper. And uh, of course, over time now, there are a lot of, uh, you know, uh, leaders who we have been able to hire who are now taking care of uh, large functions uh, themselves. And, uh, but something as uh, critical, um, uh, you know, as, as innovation is, is, is something that Guzzle still continues to lead, lose her sleepover and, and, uh, um, and, and community again, right? That's, that's something which is close to her heart and uh, only a founder can sort of, you know, make the connects that that uh, she's able to because of her story. So continues to sort of do that. So, so what are, for the, you know, D2C entrepreneurs listening to the podcast right now, what were the first uh, right things that you did, you know, back in 2016, back in 2017, that lay the foundation of distribution, product and branding on all of these three aspects? So, uh, you know, I think I think from a perspective of what we did right, uh, I'd say um, one our our whole focus on uh, building the right brand construct and story. Right? Um, why does the brand exist? And uh, what should people remember about the brand once they have heard or used the brand? And, if they had to tell the story of brand to others, right? uh, what is that story that they will tell? And, uh, crafting that entire piece, crafting then the mix, which is packaging, design, pricing, in line with that story. I think I think that's one thing which which was 
um, which has been a core success factor of what we did right then and have been continuing to do it since then. And, um, secondly, I would just say, you know, paranoia around product quality and, um, and, and paranoia around getting feedback from consumers on, on that quality as well. Um, you know, I, I still remember, uh, you know, especially Guzzles used to have like these hundreds of calls every week, which were with consumers, influencers who were sampling our products and, um, you know, to, to ensure that we're getting the right feedback, which will go into product development. So I think that is, that is something that we did right then and has been helping us uh, uh, even today because it almost becomes a part of your DNA. Um, and, and then I think third, uh, um, just just uh, um, getting the right people in whenever you can. Man. I mean, I think I think that has um, that has tremendously helped us as well, right? So um, those three is what I would say. Gazal, if you want to add um, any any more to this, no, no. I think I think you you've captured it all. You know, purpose based brands like Varun said was something that was our focus. Uh, we just did not want to deliver products to our consumers, but we wanted them to understand why this brand over anything else, right? Um, which is which is where the entire purpose. And I think our very recent initiative that we have picked up, which is our plant initiative, um, has has really helped us make that connect with our consumer. Um, you know, it's it's. Uh, for for all the um, you know listeners out there, plant initiative is is um, something that we have picked up around three to four months back. Where every order that gets placed on the website, um, we actually link it with a tree um, that gets planted um, on the behalf of our consumers, and consumers can actually you know track what species of the tree have we planted, its geolocation, where is it planted, you know and all of that through the way. So, so what they get to know is that it's not just a product that they've bought, but they've also contributed in some way to take care of the environment around them. Second, I think on-trend innovation, like Varun said, was, was something that um, you know, was, was focused for us. Um, the quality of the product, listening through our listening tools around what are consumers looking for, what they are searching for, and, and coming up with um, you know, products uh, according to their wishes was, was something that um, we did aggressively and, and um, right people, I think they can make all the difference and, and um, we realized that early on. These are the things which, which I, I would say really worked to our favor. Uh, Gazal, which have been the best seller products from day one? Like you have over 90 products now, if I'm uh, right? Yes. yes, yes. So I think uh, from day one, I, from day one, there have been a lot of hero products, if I have to call them out. I mean, we started with baby category where our first hit was a 100% natural mosquito repellent spray, uh, which, which you know, uh, caught the eyes, did really well, created a lot of buzz because uh, it, was, it was the first of its kind product that came in India, right? Um, that was followed very closely by our baby cleansing range where shampoos and washes did ex extremely well. Um, you know, even our in the baby category, our toothpaste is our best seller, which is a fluoride-free toothpaste, um, uh, which is which is strawberry flavor. Kids love it, and and we are sort of winning hearts through that. If I come to hair category, and we have we are we are into hair, we are into skin, we are into uh, body. Each of these categories have their own hero products and hero ingredients, right? So uh, here we have the onion range, which targets um, on reducing hair fall. Um, and, and in that, I think our shampoo and oil are, are um, you know, the best sellers. In skin as a category, we have vitamin C range with almost nine different products, um, you know, in which our face washes and serums um, are doing really well, for, followed very closely by our face cream. So uh, there are a lot of, hero products, but I'd say, you know, uh, onion and vitamin C in, in uh, the adult category is doing really well. And then baby, the cleansing, as well as the toothpaste, including soaps, et cetera, are doing really well. And one, if you can share, you know, your initial journey uh, from zero to one CR of uh, monthly net revenues, and then one to 10 CR, and 10 to now 50 CR of monthly net revenue, how would you split that up? What are the things that you did 
for distribution, especially, right? What are the channels you tapped into at each stage of the journey? From a, from a, from purely a distribution perspective, uh, zero to one was largely led by third party channels like you know Amazon, First Try, Flipkart. Um, we were we were fairly you know new then. We were also um, we were also sort of you know largely bootstrapped in terms of the funds that we had raised. Um, and uh, uh, from that perspective, hence it was very important to get efficient PNL going. And, um, which is where all of these channels where traffics were already there, people were already looking for such product uh, helped. Right? Uh, and hence largely the focus in zero to one was the, um, was the e-commerce platforms. And um, one to 10 is where we strongly started focusing on our D2C uh, channel. Right? Um, we realized that you know one control over on your own data experience for the consumer is far higher when it comes to D2C. Uh, secondly, your ability to scale uh, is, is far higher because it, it's again a 100% market share channel. Right? Um, and, and thirdly, your, your dependence uh, is, is reducing on others, which is also helping you de-risk the business. So that, that, uh, that was our focus from a 1 to 10 journey perspective. And, and 10 to 50 is when we also started uh, focusing on offline um, as a segment, and, and uh, we have we have uh, expanded to almost ten thousand stores now, and, and uh, that has uh, that has driven a lot of growth in, in during during that journey. Uh, you know, so so that's how I'd say distribution has panned out. And, and uh, can you share about the key fundraisers? Like, when did you raise from Fireside? When did the next round of sales happen? And at what milestone did you raise from Sikoa? So. Fireside, we raised largely, uh, you know, when when we uh, uh, when when we were seeing what you call product market fit. Right? So uh, I would say we were at uh, uh, revenue run rates of about 25, 30 odd lakhs a month, right? about six months into our journey, seeing really good feedback on our products. Right? Now wanted to execute a few things and go out in the market get some you know marketing at scale going which is when fireside and titan uh, came on board right uh, gave both money as well as guidance in terms of how do you um, sort of you know do things in the right manner um, and then uh, stellaris uh, uh, round happened when we had hit the one crore a month kind of mark and uh, where again uh, then we were looking for growth capital to sort of scale to the next level and um, and we were also looking at scaling and building the D2C channels. We were also looking at someone who has more technology orientation and skill to sort of come in and partner with us. Um, and then Sequoia happened once we were closer to a hundred crore run rate, right? um, which is where we saw, you know, them as a great partner who's got uh, um, strong learnings around taking you know building companies from 100 to 1000 crore kind of run rates and uh, secondly strong global connections as well as learnings and, and they could open doors and um, also they're a large fund so they can actually partner through your journey for for the next few um, you know years decades etc so that's how that's how we looked at it and Gazal, what do you think you know what what where did traditional brands lack that you as Mama Earth leveraged uh, in, in your journey and became the fastest growing D2C brand of India? I think I think there were a couple of things. To, to start with, I think the D2C model that we picked up, right, which was um, online first, uh, give us a lot of advantage. We were able to reach to a wider base, base of consumers, in a short span of time, they were, you know, spread all over India. Uh, I think that reach and that kind of targeting on what is the kind of consumer that you want to reach, that was that was the first um, advantage that we got in terms of getting out there. Um, second, like we've talked about the fact that, you know, having a purpose behind a brand really builds and adds on to the story. And from day one, I think we were very clear that we are, we are, here to build a brand which has a purpose. Uh, then um, I think I would say again, 
um, the way we innovated and the way we understood our consumers and what they were looking for and gave them solutions through our products, um, uh, you know, that worked to our advantage uh, really well. And uh, from a, you know, uh, from a mom and baby care brand, now you have extended and opened up another brand called the Derma Company. How has this transition worked? What was the idea and insight to work on, you know, these different dimensions? I think for for us, uh, you know, we, we started realizing, um, uh, Sid, that, that clearly we were building center of excellence, right? We were building certain playbooks and right? Uh, because of what we have learned on Mama Earth. Right? And uh, once we sort of, you know, had comfort around some of those playbooks, right, and we started looking at, um, you know, the, the consumers that we service, which is the millennial cohort, right, and, and started saying, hey, what else are they looking for? Right? Um, what kind of either propositions or products uh, or problems are they going through, which we cannot solve for, because of the way Mama and brand is constructed, and, um, and which is where we realized that you know there was there of course was a large cohort of people who is looking for natural as an option, and, but then there is also a large cohort of people who are struggling with problems like acne or pigmentation and are looking for uh, science-based you know solutions which are potent enough to sort of solve some of those problems and and are comfortable applying, you know, uh, um, uh, acid peel or something like that, which will actually solve what they're going through. Um, um, which is when the, the whole idea of uh, um, building the Derma company as a separate brand sort of, you know, came in and using the strengths that we already had at the company level. And, um, and um, you know, we, we now, after seeing the success of, of TDC, um, we are fairly confident that this is an ongoing strategy that, that we'll continue to execute over the next five years. So, so on, you know, as you shared, what does the next five years of Mamas look like? You know, most important question would, uh, on, on the listener's mind would be, when are you going IPO? What are the other new brands that you're launching? So from, from a, no, I, I wouldn't say next five years, just of Mama, that I'd probably then talk about because it's the company, not just the brand, and who, where, where the house of brand strategy would be implemented. So from a company, from a mama perspective, I think we, we just will continue to focus on um, serving the consumers in the right manner, growing our consumer fraternity, and hence growing the brand, um, you know, disproportionately. And, um, but from a company perspective, I think, yes, we are looking um, to, to launch or, or build more brands uh, which which uh, connect well with our cohort of millennials mm -hmm. um on the ipo question i i really don't have a answer right now from a um uh, from a company uh, you know readiness perspective i, I think we are we, we we would be ready uh, as of as of yesterday also right from a size the fact that we're a bit profitable but um, we we just don't feel that we need to raise from public markets as we speak, and, um, because the business is, is fairly strongly funded from um, the private markets that we have raised, right? and, and uh, we would want to focus on getting the growth, getting our narrative, and building some of these new brands up also uh, going over the next five years. And, and um, then as and when we feel okay now we're 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 sort of uh, in a position where we have been able to set all our narratives right and is when we probably think about an ipo as well uh Gazan, uh how are you able to you know uh, relate to the the first set of mothers let's say the first set of thousand mothers because now you have million plus consumers and i think the first set of thousand mothers would have played a big role in mama's journey yeah, absolutely. I think um, when we were starting out, even before launching the brand, I was talking to a lot of moms out there just to understand uh, their problems, right? Just to understand how they are feeling. Um, the, what is it that will help them further ease down their journey of, um, you know, raising a kid, uh, all of that. And just from that perspective, I think there was that first connect that... Uh, 
is that got established where where people just felt that there's someone who's listening right there's someone who's who's trying to get to know us better and trying to understand okay what are their difficulties um and as we went on in the journey of you know launching the brand coming out the proposition of toxin free the education around toxin free because at that point of time this was a fairly new concept and nobody was talking about um harmful ingredients and you know we started out by educating consumers on what toxins were why were they you know uh, why why should you avoid them how should you read labels i think that acted as a value add which people really ap appreciated and and with those uh, you know first set of thousand moms we were so closely connected with everything that we were doing with every product that we, that we were about to come in you know uh, sending them samples taking their feedback reiterating the formula basis their feedback they just felt that they were a part of this entire process of creating the brand um, um i think that is something that uh, still connects a lot of us together in the community and that's how we've been able to grow because we do that even today uh, you know before launching a product out it goes to our um community for testing uh, they are the ones who give us the first round of feedback basis which we iterate till the time they don't give us approval that yes this is the kind of product that they'll want to use the product doesn't get launched so um i would say that personal connect and and taking their inputs was something that brought us really close together i remember you uh, as a you know back in 2016 and even in 2017 uh, coming on to some of the baby go go physical community events interacting with moms there you know sharing yes. samples right That's absolutely, a, absolutely. So that's a wonderful to to see a founder, you know, who has such a deep connection to a ground and, and to the customers. Um, I think that's one of the key successes, as you mentioned, were in the in the journey of uh, Mama Earth. Or well, if you can share, you know, with the D two C entrepreneurs listening, who were the first set of the right partners for you in in shipping, in logistics, in packaging, in marketing, right? Uh, how did you identify these partners? because from uh, 2016 to 2021 today you know building a 500 cr net revenue company would have required required a lot of help you know it says that it takes a village to raise a child and <laughs> definitely yeah, yeah, of course right so um so honestly yaar uh, you know uh, initially there were there were uh, this ecosystem was also evolving when we were building this right so um i think ship rocket has been one of our early partners and and we continue to sort of work with them today as well and um on packaging side we've worked with multiple folks like you know bizongo and moglex and who have helped us you know source uh, the right kind of packaging and, um and then uh, on you know so um uh, now of course this ecosystem is far more evolved right and in each one of your um uh, sort of sub functions uh, there are partners who are available who can who can make the life uh, easier but in our case uh, you know we had to set some of these things up like you know large owned warehouses we still continue to own and operate warehouses and um own tech stacks we we believe that you know we'd rather build um, a strong custom owned tech stack than only rely on on saas based tech stacks as we scale and so we we did that right but before that uh, woocommerce is is where we were early on uh, operating woocommerce shopify both great platforms uh, and and on that then there is of course ecosystem of a lot of great partner tools that you can use to get things going so yeah i mean those those would be the right names that i would say on marketing side we've always done everything in house right? and uh, we always believe that you know marketing and product are our core competence for a company like this and um, hence um, that strength should lie internally and uh, uh, you know uh, how you got in shilpa shetty the story is really interesting so tell me at what point in the journey you reached out to her and how did you convince her I, I heard that it took her six months to say yes, uh, right? How has the journey been with her? Yeah, Gazal should sort of share that whole piece and how it sort of shaped up. It's a, it's it's actually a little crazy, right? We um, we were we were thinking of getting a 
a brand ambassador, a face for the brand, right? And um, we we did not come up with a better name than Shilpa with the with her way of living, with the values that she, um, you know, was was standing for, was was very close to us as Mama Earth. We reached out. We we met her in Delhi, um, you know, which was our first meeting where we sort of went, pitched her what Mama Earth was all about, and we had taken this small bag of products just to show her, um, you know, how we looked. Um, and I remember, you know, we had like a decent uh, forty-five minute conversation um, where she raised a few concerns, questions around the brand, around the ingredients, and she was well informed. She she actually knew some of the ingredients that that should have been avoided. And, um, you know, after that 45 minute session, we just left the bag there. We, we you know, requested her to try out and we came back. And for the next three months, have you, I think we were very eagerly waiting for her revert, which did not come. We followed up, nothing happened, right? And we were like, see, this is not happening. We haven't heard back and we lost all hopes. And I think it was after nine months when we got a call where you know she sent us this message that she had been using the products for all that while to see how they did you know, on her son Vian and um, you know she loved the products and that's how she wants to come on board and I mean I mean the the surprise was that she didn't just want to be the face of the brand but she also wanted to invest in the company which was which was our first you know um <laughs> i think the solid uh, uh you know interaction with her where we said that okay whatever we are doing we are headed in the right direction and there are people who are believing in us and uh, that's how we got her on board so this is year 2016 or 2017 2017 2017 yeah 17 end is when this really sort of in took shape 16 exactly. december is when we launched uh, sid so 16th of course there was nothing right so 17 is when she she came on uh, she she sort of started interacting and 18 is when she finally came on board and and uh, how has been the journey been right how has been is she able to add value over a period of time uh, as a brand ambassador to mama earth well, of course of course right so uh, like Gazal said, I, I, we we don't think anyone could have been a better fit from from just the value systems perspective, right? And if you follow her on her social and her Instagram, you would see she's fairly careful about what she eats, what she means, the kind of life she lives, a yoga wellness ambassador. Um, and from that perspective, it just uh, um, it just fit in really well with the brand ethos, right? And um, she started using her um, you know, social strength and, and the reach that she had to spread the message around what we were doing at Mama Earth, um, you know, building, um, you know, and, and we could, we could, we had now had a face uh, to go with our ads or, or, or to put on our website or to take to the partners that we're going to, um, which, which made the, the credibility of the brand um, you know, increase a few more notches because someone like that who has strong imagery was connecting and, and partnering with us in our journey gave us that credibility boost. So, so of course, a lot of help. And what you have been uh, able to leverage uh, the influencer marketing really well in the journey of Mama. So if you can share, you know, what, what are the different uh, uh, stages that in 2017, 2018, 2019 and the, the last year, how you leverage influencer marketing to build the branding as well as distribution? More than more than um, you know stages. It, I think I think since day one we've been committed to this whole insight that millennials trust other millennials, right? So it started with the insight that moms trust other moms, and and then of course as we continued to scale our portfolio, it went into the larger insight of you know, millennials trusting other millennials. And, uh, you know, we have been sort of, you know, building our, our influencer programs uh, on the top of those insights. We, uh, we sample extensively with influencers, get them to try our products, uh, share our story with them. And, and that's how that, that whole channel has been built. And, um, and over time, as the influencer ecosystem in India expanded, right? I remember when we were launching 
at that time uh, blogging ecosystem was far bigger um, and other ecosystems were far smaller um, um, but over time then um, blogging became less so uh, instagram influencer became bigger and, and then vlogging became bigger which is video blogs etc and so wherever we could execute that communication inside that we had and we just we just followed uh, how the ecosystem was shaping up and and ghazal uh, you know being co-founders and partners was the one best habit you know you admire about each other and was one habit you don't admire or wish you could change in each other <laughs> I think the 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 flip side, which is not admire or could change, can be a long list. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but but I think this this entire journey, um, you know, of of building something together, you know, going through a lot of ups and downs and figuring stuff out, has just just brought us closer. And that I would say our bond has only strengthened since we started out. Um, you know, one thing that I really admire about Varun is um, his problem-solving attitude, right? Be it as a co-founder, be it as a life partner, uh, you know, if you're if if there is something that's bothering you, right, and and you're not honestly looking for a solution, but you're just wanting to share it, right? Wanting to express that, okay, this is something which is disturbing me. The way he thinks is that. He needs to solve that, right? He will he will continuously start thinking of ways to make that situation better or overcome that. And you know, I wish I had that a little bit of that in me because I still spend a lot of time just thinking and you know getting sad that okay, there is this problem, uh, we have to do something about it, and and you know just waste about six seven hours just thinking that okay, this needs to be solved. While he thinks that okay let's let's overcome it okay what are the ways you know he'll give you three options right there and then that just completely changes and shifts your mindset to something positive uh, rather than just you know uh, contemplating on what's going to happen so i don't think he has ever heard that before but yeah <laughs> and Varun, what about you you know what 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 do you like really uh, find the aspirational habit or the look look up to in Gazal as a co-founder first yeah so I, I think as a co-founder she's she's uh, very patient and empathetic and uh, when it comes to dealing with uh, people and and uh, you know um, managing her relationships and um, I, I, I I sort of uh, lack that to a certain extent and uh, especially patience and um, and, and uh, I, I do admire um, and, and aspire to have uh, uh, some of that sort of, you know, in me as well. And I still remember uh, during our early days, right, we, we had to sort of, there were no agencies, nothing, right? So we had to talk to all of these influencers or, or bloggers or bloggers, right, no, whatever they, they were at that time, and, um, uh, and and tell them about our story as to what we are doing and how things are shaping and I remember Gazal did about 700 conversations in three months, and which were direct conversations selling and telling our story. So that level of patience, I surely don't have. It's, it's amazing, you know, what, what can partners like, there has always been a bias that partners should never be co-founders, but you guys have demonstrated, right? How can partners leverage each other's strengths and grow such an incredible brand? It's the brand almost every millennial looks up to. So thank you so much, you know, Varun and Gazal. You guys have been an inspiration. <laughs> right? Even I and Nancy are co-founded in this 100x Entrepreneur podcast and the fund as well. And we look up to you whenever, you know, there is a fight that, you know, these guys built such a huge brand, right? We guys can stick together too as co-founders. Definitely partners for life, but co-founders too. Super. No, thank you so much for having us on the podcast. And and thank you for those kind words. It means a lot. Thank you. Thank you so much.